we did skip over something important in New Orleans that does matter both in regards to your book and to your life. Uh, you learned some important lessons from a man named Danny Barker in uh, New Orleans. Uh, can you talk about uh, who Danny Barker was and what he taught you? Sure. Well, my my main reason for moving to New Orleans is because I, I got really uh, fascinated with early New Orleans music and the, the uh, the origins of jazz. And at that time in the 90s, early to mid 90s, you could still find guys in New Orleans who had played with people like Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong in, in the early days. Um, guys who were in their 80s and 90s who had been there at the, at the dawn of jazz. So that idea was just completely captivating to me. And my my main reason for going there was to find those guys and listen to them and sit at their knees. Um, and one of those guys was Danny Barker, who had played with Jelly Roll and played with uh, Duke Ellington and Cap Calloway um, and was and a legend in, in his own right in New Orleans. And a teacher for Wynton Marsalis, if I'm correct. I mean, he Danny Barker, I think, taught just about every musician in, in some way or another over a period of several decades. Yeah. He was just one of those elder statesmen in, in New Orleans that everybody knew and loved. And um, and he played the six string banjo, which I loved about him because I had a six string banjo huh. and I didn't know that many other six string banjo players. So I went and heard him as often as I could. And he uh, encouraged you uh, to get over your shyness, I think is uh, key that there was a community waiting for you and you needed to get in there and be a part of it. He did. I think he, the first time that I talked to him, I think I, I was quite reserved and, and shy and standoffish. And uh, I think Danny Barker was very much a New Orleanian in that he, he uh, was not into formality. You know, it was, we're all together here and um, there's, there don't need to be these barriers. There doesn't need to be this kind of stiffness. Um, the, the, that idea of uh, the city as, as the big easy, as a place where um, you can take it easy and that sort of Northern uptightness, doesn't. there's no place for it. Did you take that with you to New York City, do you think? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Everything I learned about music, I learned in New Orleans. And, and, and a lot of it has to do with, with just that, which is breaking down any kind of um, intellectual approach to music, mm -hmm. um, any kind of artifice to music, um, any kind of theory over practice. Yeah. All that went away. Yeah. That leads us to your recordings. You have a number of them. Um, I think seven or eight albums that I found, uh, and I enjoyed listening to them. Um, and I want to talk to talk about them. Uh, is it true that you discovered that you liked to play the guitar because you heard uh, Cat Stevens in Harold and Maude, that wonderful film? That is the the impetus that led me to pick up guitar. Yeah, um, yeah. I loved that film Harold and Maude, and of course Cat Stevens' music was such an integral part of it. Yes. Um, and yeah, I went out and bought a cheap guitar like the next day after, after <laughs> watching that film and, and a book of Cat Stevens songs. Yeah. And uh, so the musicians on your albums are generally, um, it's the same makeup. Typically it's a trumpet, it's a violin, it's a bass, and it's you on guitar and uh, usually singing. No drums. Is there a reason there was no drums? Oh, well, it's, it's possible that um, not all my albums were available at where you were listening, I don't know, but there are there are a number of albums with drums as well. Oh, okay, um, maybe I'll, I just wasn't paying attention. No, no, no. That, but uh, it's true that the first couple couple of albums of mine were all acoustic without drums, mm -hmm. and um, that's just the instrumentation I used when I was in New Orleans, and so I brought it with me to New York. Were these musicians on your albums the one you played with, the ones you played with in the subway? Of uh, some of them, yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. These are very good musicians uh, that you're highly virtuosic. Were they unschooled like you or were they, uh, had they studied and everything? Well, the primary, excuse me, the primary um, musical voice in my early ensembles and 
somebody who still plays with me today, but a formative part of a formative um, color in the, the music that I have made on record has been the violinist Russell Farhang, uh, who I've been playing music with now for a quarter century. And uh, Russell is a classically trained violinist. And uh, the fact that um, he comes from that background and my dad had that background is, has not been lost on, on other people. Um, I, I think having that, having that tone in my music has been very important to me. And, and he is, as you say, a virtuosic player, just an unbelievable musician. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you a, a question about your choices on your recordings. There is a consistency of style to them, which is a little odd. Um, and I, I want to discuss it with you. You present yourself as the band leader in a very raw, vulnerable light in your recordings. Uh, your singing and playing are solid, but they're not at the same level of virtuosity as the bandmates. And this strikes me because usually, if it was just a question of skill, usually a band leader whose skill is lower than their, the other musicians, they would disguise that with production. They would do stuff to make it, to even it out. But you haven't hidden that fact. You've gone no, ahead I haven't. And, yeah, yes. that's true. So it's deliberate. Why Why have you chosen to be the Clark Kent of the uh, Justice League of America? Well, I always say that uh, the musicians that I hire make me look uh, better. I, I mean, why Why wouldn't I hire the best possible musicians that are much better than me to, to perform with me? Um, well, I, I can answer that real quickly. Occasionally, there's a risk of them overshadowing you, and that's the risk you took. Sure. Um, and I don't know, maybe at times they do overshadow me, but I, I tend to think of it as um, the kind of relationship where there is um, there is a mutual benefit to, to what we're to what we're doing. Um, perhaps the uh, sort of rawness and unschooled approach that I have um, balances out some of some of the more schooled approach that they have and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Um, your, it seems to me you relied heavily on uh, spontaneity. There wasn't much editing. I could be wrong and I'd love to know if I am, but it seemed there wasn't much editing, a lot of first takes, or you trusted in whatever came out on the recording. I'm sure you had takes you preferred, but it doesn't sound like highly produced stuff. It sounds like I trust you and here's what we are. That's exactly right. And it's, it, it's an attempt to replicate what we do when we perform live, uh -huh. which is uh, different from a jazz performance uh, or a, a sort of a typical jazz performance where um, maybe the tune and the arrangement are the same from night to night, but what changes is the improvisation of each player from night to night. Uh, when we perform, what changes from night to night is um, the arrangement of the song, the tempo of the song, and the key of the song, uh, even the style of the song, and sometimes the lyrics of the song, um, who is going to improvise and when and how. Uh, there's a lot of playing without a net when we perform live to the extent that some people have suggested it's more like performance art than a, than a, than a musical performance. Uh, so there's an attempt to try to capture that on, on some of the recordings but it's never as good as it is in person. Well, you're a theater person. Is that true? Do you consider yeah. it performance art? I do in a way. I mean, I never had thought about it until somebody said that to me not, not long ago. And, and I started talking about it uh, in that way with other people and they agreed. So now I think, yeah, maybe it is sort of a, a, a theatrical sort of experience in a way, even though there's nothing remotely theatrical about uh, our presentation if that makes sense. It does. It does. Uh, you even said once um, that uh, when you were when you were uh, talking to Terry Gross on Fresh Air, you mentioned something I found fascinating. Your music is very old fashioned. You do songs that maybe only Tiny Tim besides you would know. And uh, you, know, I, you said yet you didn't want there to be a solid connection with the past. I thought that was kind of strange. Do you remember saying that? I don't remember saying that, but I, I'm not interested in nostalgia and I, I never have been. Um, yeah. I enjoy um, taking from a variety of musical influences, 
whether it's from 1923 or 2023 and mixing them in. But uh, I never want to try to replicate something that's already happened because that seems kind of silly. I see. So this is, in a sense, a, a way to fight back against the disnifying of New Orleans music, for instance, that you didn't like, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that... Um, yeah, I just think that trying to do what other people have have already done is it, uh, is boring. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing interesting about that to me. Yeah, so in other words, you are trying to take this music in and present it as who you are rather than this is, it's not a museum piece. I'm living this music, even though it's old, I'm living this music now and re, re, rebirthing it. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to styles, whether it's it's uh, classic New Orleans jazz or blues or country music or rock and roll or tango or classical music, um, <clears throat> I think of those things as colors that a painter might use. Mm. And just like a painter is not going to restrict, a good painter is not going to restrict themselves most of the time to using just red and blue, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say, well, I play jazz and blues. Um, those are two of a, a wide palette of music that I hope I can, I can draw from it at any time and try to make something new out of it. But, but what's being made is a picture. It's not a series of colors. You know, the colors are just what's filling in, what's helping to illustrate the larger thing. And the thing is what's important. This is really fascinating to me. The idea that you're painting with genres, you're taking a visual art approach to the creation of music. It's a really interesting combination. Well, as I say, I think the expression is the most important thing and the expression is what the picture is. And all those, yeah, I'm just being redundant now, but all those other elements are just, they're just colors. They have nothing to do with the picture. I mean, they fill out the picture, but the picture is the thing. Yeah, I understand. Uh, would you indulge me? Uh, there were four tracks that I found particularly interesting, and I'd like to ask you about them if you don't mind. Great. Okay. The first one I, I want to ask you about is I've Got the World on a String, which has okay. a wonderful tempo change right in the middle of it, and it sounds immensely spontaneous. All of a sudden, it goes double time without any preparation. Do you remember that? Uh, I, I know the track you're talking about. It's on my first album. That's and right. Of course, that's not an original song. It's an, it's an old standard. Um, and, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I don't remember, um, the particulars of that recording, uh, but I imagine that, yes, it was completely spontaneous. Yeah, there was a, there was just a moment where it just felt like it was in the air to, to make the song go double time for whoever was soloing at that point, and that's what we did. Yeah, well, as a jazz musician, you know, I know that sometimes tempos can change mid-tune, but often they change you know, when the song comes around, it's rare to have them change right in the middle. And it's it's a risky thing to do. So it was it's pretty exhilarating. Thanks for saying that. And I, I think that's one of the nice things about playing with a group that performs over and over again um, in concert, uh, that when you get into the recording studio, you're already a, a fine tuned machine, a well oiled machine. And you're just you know what each other might do next and you can anticipate it. So if I just, like, I probably only needed one stroke of my guitar in double time for the bass player and the violin player to understand that that's what was going to happen next, and they just went with it. Yeah. Yeah. The song Dating Game is a little unusual in all your songs. It's a little more over the top than the rest of your repertoire. Could you talk about Dating Game? Sure. That comes from an album called Do What I Want and is also probably a track that I haven't played or thought about in many years and, and probably is irrelevant today because of all the changes in the ways that people date since it was written uh, 20 years ago or so. Uh, that song, uh, gosh, how did it come about? I think it, it came about even before we added electric instruments and drums when we were still an acoustic quartet. And um, it was more just kind of a rant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think it is relevant that. today, knowing my cousins who are dating. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe it needs just a lyric update or something to make it a little bit uh, less anachronistic or not an anachronistic, but uh, 
a little less um archaic archaic yeah <laughs> um uh i i don't know where that song came from but it was uh a fun one to explore with with the group that i had at that time and it was fun that they let me explore it because it was so different from the other songs on the record yeah it propels you into sort of talking heads territory a little bit <laughs> oh thanks that's quite a compliment well, there is a David Byrne aspect to your singing, I noticed, and uh, that song probably is the one where you can hear it the most. It's kind of a, a combination of um, mania that makes sense and also maybe a bunch of things that seem to be picked up off a Scrabble board. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, you went to Romania and you right. produced an entire album about that experience. And the song that I found most compelling off that album was Farmer's Song. Oh, great. Um, yeah, that song that so that record is called No Further Instructions, and it's a song cycle about this trip that I took with one of my closest friends uh, through rural Romania, through the north of the country in a, a region called Maramuresh. And um, we were wandering through a village one day, and uh, villages in Maramuresh, many of them have no running water, no electricity. It's kind of like being thrust back into uh, through a time machine into another century. And we passed um, some huts that had many multiple, um, uh, there were pails that were hung outside the houses, uh, colorful pails in all, uh, all different hues. Some huts had a few pails, some had none, some had, uh, and when I say a pail, I mean like a bucket. Yeah, if you can picture it, um, hung on hooks on the sides of the on the huts. We couldn't figure out what they were, and we stopped. Uh, we found somebody who spoke English, which was not a common thing in that part of the of the country. And we said, "What is it? What are all these pails on this on the side of the hut?" And they said, "Oh, well, that if there are pails hung on the side of the hut, that means that there's an um, a marriageable woman in the house." And the more pails there are, the, the larger the dowry is. <laughs> wow. um, so we were walking through a village like this, and we uh, came to a, a, a cemetery in the woods that had a path that led up through the woods. And we came to a clearing. And in the clearing, there was uh, wheat as far as the eye could see. And far in the distance was a farmer and his wife that were working the field. And we made our way th across about a football field's length um, to them. And they spoke no English and we spoke no Romanian. And I think they, they were sort of looking at us as though we had stepped out of a spaceship or something. Um, and the farmer song is my imagined conversation with them had they spoke English. Right. That's a long-winded answer to that. No, question. that's good. No, and you, you you break off, so I guess people will have to listen to the song to find out what you thought they said. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Um, of all the songs you sing that are standards, because I, as I mentioned, I'm a jazz musician and I've spent a lot of time learning hundreds of songs, and one of the ones you do that I found most compelling, not just because it's one of my favorites, but because I heard something. I imagined in your performance that maybe perhaps meant something to you, but I'd like to check on that. The song is I Get Along Without You Very Well. Mm. Did I hear something extra in that song? Is it something special to you? That is a special song to me. It, it's always been a very touching song to me. And it, that song comes from the, uh, the Quartet Volume 3 album, which is all Hoagy Carmichael songs. Um, you know, I was always touched by the story behind that song, which you probably know that it was, uh, the lyric was printed, I think in the Saturday evening post, uh, and it was an anonymous, anonymous writer and Hoagy Carmichael set it to music. And then there was like a nationwide search to find the composer of the, of the lyric right. so that he could publish it. And the woman who ended up being the, the writer of the lyric, I want to say, the story is that she died like the night before he performed it for the first time on the radio. Um, there's a longing in that song and in that lyric and in that melody that is, I find to be very poignant. And it's a, 
it's an example of a song, a rare example of a song from that period, from that um, sort of arena of popular music where there's real vulnerability, where I hear real, real vulnerability. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I like that song very much. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to you about uh, yourself. Let's return to Connie Converse. Um, in your book, you write, how might Connie Converse have fared had she lived in a society in which everyday creativity was honored and all took a genuine interest in these things one another made? Uh, is that a society to which you aspire? Have you tried to live that? Well, yeah. Um, yes and yes. Um, I aspire to it. I, I would, I wish that our society would aspire to it. And it is something that I've tried to live uh, in uh, just trying to pay attention to what, what people are doing in ways that are meaningful to them. Yeah. Well, you also write, how many more Connie Converses are out there, marginalized talents waiting to be heard? Are you looking for these people? Well, am I looking for them? I, I feel that um, I've always, ever since I was a kid, I was always interested in things that were hidden in some way. And maybe my greatest joy has always been leading people to the things that I find and sharing the treasure with them. Being able to say, look at this amazing thing that I found that it seems very people few people know about. Isn't it great? Uh, I would do that with stamps and coins and comic books and things when I was a kid. And that grew into a love of obscure plays and fiction and music and film. And I think, I don't know if I would say that I'm always looking for those things, but they seem to find me. And in the way that Connie Converse found me, I wasn't looking for her. Connie Converse found me. Um, and when these things find their way to me, I, I, I just want to tell the world about them. Yeah. Um, I want to put a few pieces together here really quickly. Uh, your dad had money, but he couldn't be himself. Uh, you decided to be yourself, and for a while at least, you had no money. And Connie paid the price for being herself. So it's an interesting kind of connection. You're, you reacted to your father's decision to uh, choose monetary security over artistic, and you rebelled against that. And then you found somebody who was punished for doing that. I think that's true. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I want to be careful not to take anything away from people who, who make money. Um, I don't think that that was the problem that my dad had, um, if he can be said to have had a problem, I think it was that he had no outlet to really be who he was. Mm -hmm. And I think he tried to make um, money, property, and prestige um, those things. And uh, he was frustrated by that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Connie, who did all these artistic things, also was unable to be who she was, even though she was choosing the opposite tack. Well, she, I think she was being who she was, but nobody could see it. Yeah. Uh, and as, as I say to people, when they ask me about the book and they ask me about her disappearance, and is my book about looking for her? Yes, it's about looking for her, but it's not about looking for her after she left. It's about looking for her before she disappeared, because that life was buried. If you could talk to Connie Converse now, what would you say to her? Well, I'd say let's go have some coffee, um, because there are a lot of things I want to talk to you about. And I would um, try to... to impress upon her. I mean, if Connie Converse suddenly appeared today and was in full um, uh, had all of her faculties, uh, her mental faculties with her, um, and let's just say she'd been completely off the grid for the last 50 years and didn't know 
anything about anything that's happened since then and had been living just among the, uh, just uh, one with nature or, or whatever cliche you want. Um, I, I think I would just try to impress upon her the idea that her activities and her life were not in vain and that uh, she now has a whole host of people who understand that she lived a very important life and is really appreciated now. You've had uh, a lot of successes in your life. Uh, you can point to a number of wonderful accomplishments. Do you feel like you have been recognized for what you have done, or do you feel closer to the way Connie felt? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I've been very fortunate, as you say, uh, in various regards in my career. Um, uh, have I reached the, the um, have the things that I've done reached their intended audience? I, I don't know. At times, at times I have felt that way. Um, I think that um, this book is a great example. I mean, I don't think it's it's uh, burning down the bestseller charts. Uh, however, the feedback that I've gotten from people that have read it has been tremendous. And um, I get emails and phone calls from people telling me how the book has affected them. And uh, some of these have, have elicited real emotional responses for me, just to know that the work that I have done has not been in vain and has been appreciated. So I would say, yes, I, I feel, I feel uh, at least in terms of this book, um, some sense of understanding on the other side of the equation. Well, Howard Fishman, how can we find you and how can we find the book? Uh, well, you can uh, you can find me pretty easily. Uh, um, there are various links on my website to the various things that I do, which is howardfishman.com, uh, and probably need some updating, but um, the basics are there. And then uh, you can find the book anywhere that sells books. Uh, I like to encourage people to support independent bookstores rather than the, the big chains, but uh, wherever it's available to you in, in whatever seems the best way, um, the most important thing is, I guess, just to um, get your hands on it if it's of interest to you and find out more about this uniquely fascinating woman. Howard Fishman, thank you for talking to us both about yourself and about Connie today. Adam, thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate your, um, your questions and your uh, deep dive into all the things that went into making this book and, and my own career. And I hope this is not the last time we get a chance to chat. Well, I hope that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you also audience. We always appreciate you tuning in and checking us out. If you like what you see, press that like button, please subscribe to our videos. And if there's somebody you'd like to see on this program that you haven't seen, please send them my way. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next time.